Thank you for participating in the ninth annual Black Star Film Festival. We would like to thank our funders and individual donors, as well as our network of producing and community partners. This panel is presented in partnership with the Undocu Filmmakers Collective. The runtime for this panel is 60 minutes, including audience Q&A. So please leave your questions in the comments and we'll do our best to engage them. Please follow us on all social media platforms at Black Star Fest and use the hashtags BSFF20 and Black Star 20 So Lit. We hope you have a wonderful time during the 2020 Black Star Film Festival. Hi everyone, our apologies about the delayed start. Thank you so much for joining this panel, Beyond the Status, Working With and Investing in Undocumented Creatives. I'm Farah, the panel producer, and it's my absolute pleasure to briefly introduce the folks participating in this conversation. Our moderator, Nicole Soleil Sison, is an artist, educator, creative director, producer, and digital content production strategist based in Los Angeles, California. Nicole is also a founding member of the Undocu Filmmakers Collective. We're also joined by V Bravo, the deputy director of Peace is Loud. V is a social impact film producer and New York native by way of Chile, who has documented hip hop, youth culture, and politics for the last 25 years. We welcome Ileana G. Perez, the Director of Research and Entrepreneurship at Immigrants Rising, where she launched the organization's entrepreneurship program, which encourages all immigrants, regardless of status, to create their own opportunities, earning a living and thrive through entrepreneurship. We're so excited to have Sheila Quintana Aguilar, a filmmaker, consultant, community, and digital organizer from Guerrero, Mexico, who calls Philly home. Shayla co-founded Bonfire Media Collective, a media production co-op making films for social change. She has nearly a decade of community and national organizing experience at the intersection of migration, criminalization, and health. We're joined by Armando Ibanez, a queer filmmaker and activist also from Guerrero, Mexico, and director and writer of the YouTube series Undocumented Tales a story that follows the journey of a Mexican undocumented and queer server living in Los Angeles. We also welcome Dilan Garcia Lopez, a filmmaker from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, based in LA, who has worked on hundreds of web episodes, commercial work, and original programming. Lastly, we want to note that while this panel centers the perspectives of migrant Latinx folks, Black Star always strives to hold the experiences of African and Caribbean migrants in our programming and acknowledges the lack of representation of these voices in this particular conversation. We trust the Undocu Filmmaker Collective's deeply intersectional framework, which understands the interconnectedness of people of the global majority working to build alternatives against the grain of global white supremacist state violence. Thank you to all of our panelists. We're so excited for this conversation. Hi, everyone. Thank you, um, Farah, for the, such a great introduction. Um, I will be your moderator today. And um, just to echo Black Stars, um, like putting front that our panel is, um, you know, lacking migrant and Caribbean, uh, African and of Caribbean uh, representation. We also do want to acknowledge um, the undocumented narratives that aren't in discussion today, such as um, undocumented people with disabilities, um, who also um, undocumented um, folks from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, Eastern Asia, um, and and European um, representation as well. So all of these um, stories are definitely um, what makes you know the undocumented landscape a very intricate one. And we are not representative of that um, narrative, but we are, um, of course, through lived experience, can 
find the intersections um, within the, um, the lack of representation of these narratives and how they are equally important. So thank you so much um, again for Black Star um, creating the space for us to speak about um, you know, what it means to work with and investing in undocumented creative, especially in a time right now where um, in this summer, um, we just had the recent SCOTUS decision um, on DACA, um, and then also the current administration trying to work around um, how to more or less diminish the program. So um, we're in this state, of course, of really empowering our community and shining light of the importance of collaboration with our communities. Um, so I would love to, you know, kick it off with um, Ileana Perez, who has done such great grass work um, organizing for us through the years. Um, and I'd love to, for Ileana to kind of explain to us what, what is the difference between, um, you know, how we can support um, undocumented and documented creators right now. What is the difference between employment and contracting and who qualifies for this category? Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much to Black Star for putting together this amazing panel of individuals to talk about these important issues that pertain to the undocumented community. Um, so I'll start off by um, answering the question in terms of the differences between employment and entrepreneurship. So um, federal law um, basically creates this concept of illegality for the undocumented population in the sense that undocumented individuals without work authorization or social security number are not legally allowed to be hired as employees. However, embedded also in the same federal law, it states that individuals who wish to pursue independent contracting or business ownership, in fact, do not need to have work authorization or social security number. All this is really embedded within um, the ability for anyone, regardless of immigration status, to be able to pursue alternatives to employment that do not require, again, having that green card and that social security number. Um, this is what then allows individuals to be able to utilize different ways to be able to um, do contract work, particularly in the arts, in film, and media. It becomes a really great way for individuals to be able to start their own companies and be paid um, for um, a particular type of work I guess when that construct of like legality right um, and for myself as a creative like my mind doesn't necessarily always like have that similar construct of like oh now I have to adhere to legal standpoints I just want to be creative I want to have the freedom to create um, so I guess with that, um, when someone like us wants to just have the freedom to create, but then there's people who are kind of gate holders who are saying, hey, wait a minute, you don't have that freedom to create actually. Um, and there, we find that there is that misconception between um, how, like, working and partnering with undocumented and undocumented persons like why why do you think that is that system exists um, well, I mean, this has a lot to do with the fact that um, it's important for individuals to know about these options. Um, at Immigrants Rising, we have spent um, the past decade um, creating information and resources to primarily inform the undocumented community about these options. So it's one um, sort of one side of the coin is to ensure that the undocumented community knows that these options are available to them. Um, and then the other side of the coin is also for um, clients and for, um, uh, for companies, for other entities to know that this is in fact a legal option to pursue um, that again does allow individuals to be able to, um, be, uh, to be paid for all that creative effort and all the creative work um, that is being done. And 
what type of resources do folks need to like be informed about to kind of reform this type of conversation specific for equitable access and you know specifically for the film industry um i would say that it's probably kind of you know the most um malleable of all industries for you know undocumented creators um, because for instance if you work in the health industry we would have to obtain certification that is governed um, by federal law whereas you know in film in film and in the arts that necessary that certification isn't valid um, like it doesn't exist um, so I would love for you to kind of share like how this system works and how can um how can we champion equitable access yeah definitely so a lot of the work that we have done is really based around this notion of developing the entrepreneurship mindset so um for many of us we sort of grow up with this idea that we need to perhaps get some type of higher education get a job and hope to be in that job um, as long as possible um, to be able to um, have um, a good living but what oftentimes we're not told is that in fact there are other ways to be able to utilize our skills our abilities our experience to be able to um, earn money um, in different ways other than employment and i think that's where um, it really becomes important for individuals to know that entrepreneurship is not this like foreign concept that only like mark zuckerberg or like ellen musk can do it's in fact something that has been very much a part of the immigrant community particularly the undocumented community um, it, with you know rooted in the fact that undocumented individuals oftentimes have to identify their own opportunities look for different ways to do things when so many other barriers are in the way so it's really a matter of um, reclaiming ownership of that entrepreneurship identity and realizing that we in fact can be creators we in fact can do so many different things without that huge barrier that employment poses on individuals um, so this is where um, uh, I definitely encourage folks to check out some of our resources. We just created a brand new um, learning hub. It's called the Undocu Hustle Learning Hub, available at undocuhustle.org. And it's intended to provide videos, worksheets for individuals to learn about these options. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not going to say that it's super easy to um, enter into entrepreneurship, learn about marketing, learn about taxes, all these different things. But I think that at the end of the day, particularly for individuals who are undocumented, who face that so many different challenges, entrepreneurship really becomes an avenue for individuals to um, think beyond their undocumented status and really realize all the opportunities that are available in the midst of so many other um, barriers, particularly around, again, the employment issue. Yeah, and I kind of want to dive into like a little bit on the nuances here, because entrepreneurship, you know, that means to say someone has to start an LLC, right? And um, I would love to, or like, a corporation but for for people with our status um, you know it's more accessible to create an LLC but what is the difference between a citizen with an LLC versus someone who is undocumented with an LLC yeah, so to answer that question, um, entrepreneurship really becomes a great opportunity to really sort of um, strip the undocumented status. Once somebody is able to incorporate either as a sole proprietor, as a partnership, as a limited liability corporation, then that individual can now conduct business in the name of um, the business rather than the individuals themselves. And ultimately what ends up happening is that an individual can definitely be undocumented um, according to federal law, but businesses cannot be undocumented. I mean, a business just does not have that, those kinds of constraints. An individual, and a business is seen exactly the same across the board, regardless of immigration status. And ultimately, that is, again, what allows individuals to be able to get paid for a particular service or a product, um, completely disregarding the notion of being undocumented, which is really a label that is only um, a, a label that exists for an individual. Oh, thank you so much, Ileana, for laying down this like understanding around, 
you know, just the legalities, because that's so important to our narratives. Um, I'd love to pivot to Armando and ask the question of, you know, what, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, what do you find define as a successful partnership and project, given, um, you know, what the subject that we're talking about today, working and investing in undocumented creatives? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here, by the way. And uh, to answer the question, uh, I think that uh, one of the successful partnerships that I have encountered in my journey as an undocumented entrepreneur uh, is that I find or I work with companies or employers that are able to find ways. And by me saying find ways is being able to listen and, and and not to get scared, you know. I feel like many companies do not know about these resources, do not know there are ways to employ. It. Uh, I don't know if employees is the, the right way, but to do independent contracting with undocumented uh, artists, undocumented creatives. And in my journey, the good partnerships that I have, or collaborations that I've been doing, it's with companies or uh, people that are true allies, that are to be able able to, to sit down and to say, okay, I want to hear more about it. Uh, I want to hear about like how we can do this. And now, before, I feel like we didn't have uh, resources. One of those resources, it's uh, Immigrants Rising, an organization that is able to educate not only the community, the undocumented immigrant community, but also these companies uh, to let them know that there are ways to collaborate uh, and, and through independent contracting is one of the things that I've been doing uh, now for a long time and, and people don't know about it. And this is one thing that um, in my case, I have been sometimes, I have been able to uh, educate uh, people or companies uh, in order to create collaborations. But some others, they just close the doors. They just like, not able to listen and i feel like nowadays we need to keep pushing for these conversations and this is why i'm so excited and very thankful with the work that the undocumented collective is doing because that's what they're doing with with different organizations and uh and foundations because this little by little we can spread the message of all the resources that and collaborations that are able to be possible um that people don't know about Thank you so much, Armando, for sharing. Um, I'd love to ask Dylan um, a different question in a way that, in what ways have people invested in your creativity that left you empowered in your role as a freelancer? I would have to say that my background and um, me being vocal about the fact that I do come from the place that I do, uh, do come from and how that compares to other people on set, um, when, when I'm able to wear that as a badge of honor, um, I have been asked from um, either the people higher above me, such as the directors or even the directors of photography, like how would you see this playing out within the scope of uh, your community? Um, that's like that's an example. That's an example to answer your question. So what I'm kind of hearing is that they see your va the value and presence of of you on set, right? And um, it's funny that you say that because you know there's so much work right now that is being centered around the narratives of immigration and um, undocumented communities, and we are definitely being sensationalized by the media right now. Um, and we often question, right, like, um, we're out here, we're filmmakers, we're screenwriters, we're DPs, we're photographers, we're producers. Why aren't we being included on set, right? And you just said, Dylan, like, you feel incredibly empowered um, when you are able to show your worth 
on in production and people who are in production with you see the value of your worth. I'd love to ask Sheila, um, like one kind of sensitive question, I guess, is like, why do you think that there isn't space or for us to exist in productions right now? And how can we empower not only ourselves, but other people to include us in those, uh, in those narratives and in the set and the set productions? Um, I want to say because of white supremacist racial capitalism um, that we don't own, right, the ways of making the media that is being made about us and that therefore the narratives that are put out there um, about people of color, about immigrants, um, about women, about people who are not owning um, the ways that we make media and the ways that we make narratives and the ways that we make images. Um, are not under our control. So oftentimes I think it's easier to digest the story of a victimized, sensationalized immigrant than it is to digest the story of a full whole person who is messy, who is emotional, who is you know, sometimes problematic, who um, is just human. And those are the stories that I think are actually humanizing the stories that are complete and that are whole, not just the stories of like, how many immigrants have we seen crying on TV, right? How many immigrants have we seen um, talking about our trauma, being re-traumatized in that process, and uh, um, only talking about how hard it is to be who we are, and not talking about like how great it is to be who you are as a person, regardless, in spite of, or because of your immigration status, even in some ways. So I think um, for me, one of the important things to keep in mind to like hail our dear Solange is that it's important to build our own tables. It's important to create our own ways of, um, of creating. And I think that the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective is doing such a great job of that. But there's also so many different examples of people just making our own ways. Um, and I think it's worth fighting for room and like for space at these like studios and spaces that have so much money and so much resource and like you said that are um, actually profiting off of stories of, of immigrant stories of, of POC stories of BIPOC stories um, and at the same time I think that we can only wait so long to create the stories that we actually want to see that represent us and that we own. Thank you Shayla for sharing. Um, I'd love to, you know, ask all three of you filmmakers, um, and anyone can ask, um, answer, um, what experiences have you had on set with a producer um, that made you feel like your status mattered more than your creativity? And what I mean by that is that you are the token immigrant that's supposed to move the story forward, right? Um, ha has anyone ever made you feel like that or has anyone ever just blatantly said we're hiring you or working with you because um, you are your status? Armando. Oh, go ahead, uh, Armando, sorry. Oh, he's muted. Oh. Dylan, would you like to go ahead? Um, Sorry, yeah, Dylan, go I ahead. wanted to say that. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say that personally, I'm yet to um, feel like I'm the I'm the token on set. Um, over the last like five or six years, I've been in the industry. I've had nothing but positive um, positive interactions with producers. Um, even when they eventually did become aware of my status. Um, it's always been supportive. It's always been positive. I've never felt like a token. Um, in fact, there's been some times where um, I feel like I, in 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 reference to your previous question as before, like I've felt like I've been able to walk on set with like a badge of honor that um, not a lot of people can relate to. 
and an example being my ability to speak uh, two languages. So being bilingual has been something that on set has been extremely useful, has made me stand out from the crowd, um, which we all know is very beneficial for longevity. And so um, additionally, I've never felt like I was um, singled out or anything. It's always been, my identity has always been supplemental um, and never something that was exploited by either producers or anything. It's yet to happen to me. And um, I've, heard, I've heard of stories, I'm aware of stories, and uh, my heart goes out to those stories. Um, but until the day that I can, I can experience it, I can't, um, I wouldn't know what it feels like exactly. Thank you so much, Dylan, for sharing that. And that is just exactly what we are fighting for across all spectrums is to have everyone to have the opportunities, to have the similar um, experience that you just described. And I'd love to, you know, hear from Armando, do you have similar or opposing um, experiences that you've had on set? Uh, you know, my experience is also different because ever since I started pursuing filmmaking, I always started doing my own work first. And after uh, collaborations started happening, and that's where I was already empowered or confident to say what I want and the type of work that I do. But what I want to say is when I get contact by different, you know, media or companies, and it, ha it has happened a couple of times where they contact me and they say, oh, hey, I work for this company. We get a million views and we're looking for an immigrant and call me. And I'm like, wait, so I don't even deserve an explanation of what's the type of project that you are trying to do. And you just heard that I am an immigrant, an undocumented immigrant. And all of a sudden you are interested, like you are still doing what Hollywood and media does, which is you're seeing me less than a human that I don't deserve the respect uh, to hurt about the project that you are doing and that I should be thankful for, for being considered to give the, the, given the exposure for your project. Uh, and these are big companies, uh, media companies that have in, in fact millions of views. When I get contact and the approach is like that, I do feel like those are the type of projects where they just want to create a project about undocumented subjects or they want to work with undocu undocumented production just because they need to check the bags. And that's when I don't, I don't even bother to reply to the message emails because I know that that's not going to be a good project when people do not even introduce themselves and they don't let me know of the type of project that they're doing. Uh, when people just say, call me, uh, it's, I find it very disrespectful uh, uh, when they contact me like that. You actually said something that I feel like I've experienced in the past couple of weeks where, you know, everyone wants to have equitable initiatives right now. Um, people are almost like f racing to the finish line to check an equitable box, right? And it's just like, who can I onboard for this initiative? to um, check this box that I'm inclusive to that community. And they're not necessarily being mindful by checking their boxes. It's actually harming also the fact that you're not even understanding the community or the nuances around our communities. Um, I'd like to pivot to Shayla of like, what do you have any um, comments or reflections just around like how companies or productions currently are just using our narratives as a as a check off their equity box. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's not something that just happens to undocumented people. I think it's all, it's like a, it's a more widespread issue where, um, just like communities of color, poor communities. Um, I think they're realizing that our lives and our stories are interesting, right? And that, that people do watch like 
uh, POC stories and people do want to see, want to um, hear a diversity of experiences. Um, and so rather than people like us having more of a say in the story or even I think with writing, you have to write in order to um, appeal to a broad audience. And I think those are artistic choices that we can each make for ourselves. Um, but it is, I think it is a problem. It is a problem that we don't, that it's really hard for us to see. And I think you see it in like what is out there, right? It's really hard to find, I don't know about you all, but I, I have have yet to find a representation of an undocumented person um, in like big media that I really like. I think there's one, the Yano Stoyaki, which I really loved. And I thought it was a really good, like complex story of an immigrant. Um, but it's really, otherwise it's really hard unless you go to things like undocumented tales and like things that like people are making and finding ways of making on your own. Thank you so much, Sheila, for sharing. And I love how you just name dropped Undocu Tales on YouTube, Armando's um, series. Go stream it. Um, it's free. Um, there's a plug right there. If people are saying that we don't have narratives, there's a perfect narrative and a storyteller right there with us. Um, but I would love to kind of dive in with V. I know, V, you've been listening to all of us here. And um, as someone who I'd like to say is, has chosen to collaborate with undocumented and documented individuals on their productions, um, I'd love to hear why, how, how has that experience elevated the work that you, you've been doing? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, like many of you, I was also undocumented uh, when I was a young person coming up as a teenager. So those experiences of having to make yourself present uh, in school, um, you know, uh, in the community are, are, are very part of my experience. Um, I experienced that through having my mother, who was my guardian at the time, um, just like advocate for herself. So she instill like these really deep values in me about like being present and advocating for yourself. <clears throat> so I, I've carried that with me throughout my work um, as a storyteller and uh, <clears throat> you know, um, advocate for you know, just POC and immigrant folks um, as a whole. Um, and I think what I can, my, my observation right now is that there are two audiences, right? There's the audience, in the film industry who has the purse that allows us to tell our stories, right? And then there's the audience itself, the people who are gonna come and relate to us. Uh, and what's unfortunate is that, you know, the, the progressive left and the center continue to use our stories as a political ploy, you know, to advance, you know, like their belief of what an equitable society is. You know, I, I wanted to throw up at the DNC last night where, after four years, four nights of touting inclusivity, there was there was not one mention of immigration, DACA, ICE, right, uh, from the two people who they're asking us to put our faith in, right? And it, it made me think about how they got to that narrative and who scripted that narrative for them, that they made the intentional choice to not have us in the larger tent of shaping, right, America. So then it made me think that, well, they think that their audience doesn't feel like they can benefit from our experiences. So in the work that I've done to promote like our stories and promote inclusivity, um, the hard lift is to just convince, uh, you know, the powerful white folks that America can benefit from our perspective, that it's not tokenism, that it's not about like checking off the box, that if you allow us, or if we take the space to frame the experience for everyone else, everyone can benefit. So then we can move away from just like always having to tell the stories that are about us, which are important. But then like, what does it really mean when you have an undocumented uh, perspective from you know, a Latinx woman who is maybe framing the talking points, right? For everyone at the DNC. Behind the camera, 
you know, doing all the show running for a, you know, show that may be targeting, you know, like white women, right? Or black folks. So I think it's going to be a huge lift, right? Because America is an insular community, right? And it is identity driven. And I think some of this work also needs to take place within other communities of color, right? Who also don't want to look or aren't interested in foreign policy. You know, we talk about our existence here, but part of our existence here has a lot to do with the things that are happening back home that are interrelated and interconnected to the foreign policy that this country, you know, spews out. So then how do you make all of this like relatable to the average person? I think we need to take those opportunities that Armando, you know, Sheila, Dylan have and ask ourselves, what do we do with these opportunities? Are we here to just integrate ourselves and say, hey, we're just like everyone else? Or are we taking those opportunities to say, hey, you know what? If I am the showrunner or if I'm scripting this or if I'm directing this, right, have a different, different the intended audience, right? Especially at a time when everyone is really interested in diversity, inclusion, and equity, right? That won't last long if it's there just because they need to feel good about themselves that we're in the room. It's not enough to just be in the room. You got to allow us to, you know, like take over the party, select the playlist, cook the food, right, that we're going to eat, right, and then curate the experience. That's how you make society more equitable, right? And until we get there, right, we're still going to have to do this work, which is like, okay, let's, let's scaffold it little by little. Each generation does that work, right? Um, the last point that I would say is that like, how do you turn this into like a practical fix? I think we need to go to our partners and have more of the foundation invest in fellowships that are earmarked for undocumented folks, right? Uh, those fellowships need to be sustained across multiple years, not just a one-off, right? Three to five years, right? That they can sort of like invest in the trajectory of an undocumented person, shape the narrative, right? Um, and then two, I think within the professional, I want to say like Hollywood-esque film space, right? I think that this is the time to actually get in there and shake things up because that, that world is feeling the pressure of us being here, right? But I think part of it is going to be that we need to go there, not alone, right? Like Dylan can't do it by himself. Sheila and Armando can't do it by themselves. We have to go there as a caucus. We have to then make inroads to the other folks of color that are already there. We need to reach out to the Cuban, Puerto Rican folks, right? Who don't often think about like your, your immigration status, but connect to us through culture, right? Through the music. Okay, so when it's time to make a case for ourselves, do we have your support? Can you stand in solidarity with us, right? As we make the ask for higher wages and inclusion. I'll stop there. <laughs> um. I do want to kind of tease um, a bit of our conversation. Um, so B and I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation a couple years, uh, not years, it seems like years during COVID, but a couple weeks ago where, you know, B and I were talking about like all the things that us in this space um, are asking for is the bare minimum. We're asking for the bare minimum of equitable um, access, equitable um, solutions. But why is it that we can't even meet that bare minimum, right? So, um, and of course, we want to move beyond the bare minimum as well. Like, we can't just continue to just fight for the bare minimums uh, that the industry can meet. And so we were talking about what the shift work, the narrative shift work that needs to happen. Um, and I f and with Dylan's um, example of how, you know, your, your, your partners have been nothing but empowering to you, have inclu like included you wholeheartedly. Um, how can we mimic that partnership more and more um, for everybody? And so, V, I kind of wanted to dive in a little bit on like, what type of narrative shift work needs to happen here? Well, I think that number one, when people say we belong, right? It is the assumption that we came and we want to belong, 
to me, it's like we've always been here, right? Um, and our history here is as long as apple pie, right? So thing number one is like debunking this myth that we were here, like we've been here for 20 years or 10 years ago, and we are now trying to get into school. This is generational. This is our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents before that, right? Uh, and also like this, this notion that if you allow us to be here, that we're gonna integrate ourselves and be part of whatever social current, right, is taking place, right? And when we think like that, what happens? The only people that get celebrated are the people that have, you know, either become citizens, join the armed forces, right, and have done something to like uplift whatever the political mandate of this country may be, even when it's hurtful to our own people, right? So I think it's like, how do we, uh, how do we create like a culture where it's okay for us to be here, right? And rock the boat, right? Um, and also like acknowledge that we're doing that because our history is also a very profound history with deep tentacles, you know, throughout the history of this country. And I think as storytellers and producers, right, we need to ask those questions. Like I always ask myself, like during the civil rights movement, right? What was the role of the people that were here undocumented, right? They were also affected by this. Like I have family members that arrived in New York in 1954. I have a relative that grew up in Newark, right? Who had pictures of like the, the, the ride to Newark, right? Like an undocumented person from Chile during the civil rights movement. Like we act like we haven't had that presence here in this country. And I think, I think it's teasing out that story making it part of the narrative, right? That we have a long relationship to this country. It's not always just embedded in the idea of wanting to participate. We have been participating, right? Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's where my headspace has been in uh, to just show continuity and legacy. Thank you so much for sharing. I'd love to open up the that specific question to um, all the other panelists, like what, from what V just um, shared, how how can we create that narrative shift work in in our roles right now? Personally, um, if I may, I definitely think that um, continuing to be vocal whenever at all possible, um, not really just hopping on trends. Um, internet trends or social trends when they are uh, popular. Um, I don't, I think that's like the way not to do it, to maintain the same level of advocacy that you had from, um, that you've always had or that has evolved. That's how, that's how we could, uh, we can make sure that we see the continuing change that we want to see. Um, and just like V mentioned is, um, keep the, the, the boat uh, rocking, not so much, um, just, you know, pedaling a little bit. Thank you so much, Dylan, for asking. Any, anyone else would like to add to the narrative shift question? I think just to add to the conversation, I think that, you know, part of what the undocumented identity oftentimes does to us is that we ourselves get caught in, you know, this identity that brings in so many limitations. So it's also important to find that awakening, awakening amongst ourselves and be able to take control of our own lives, tell our own stories, um, and really sort of break through that huge barrier that is artificially imposed on us. Um, and that's why I am so fond of the great work that Armando and so many artists are doing to just not let anyone define them and really hold on to their own stories and be able to create those stories um, and really challenging you know the common narratives or just the way things are done the status quo and just saying you know what despite what everyone else is saying I'm still gonna go on and do something on my own find the way to fund it bring another undocumented people to the table to be able to do that thank you so much Eliana for sharing I 
Before, right before we kick off to Q, oh, the open floor q and I'd love to ask um, everyone here, um, how can we hold partners and institutions accountable for the this creative space um, and also inclusivity for our our community? Like, what does that look like for everyone? I think that um, I mean that's for me that's a very um, that's a very uh, complicated question, right? Because like we're still, I feel like there's still, we're still like, uh, for me the, the the most direct answer is to keep building community, uh, because true community is that we have been able to create the changes that we are creating lately. You know, there are so many organizations now that are creating uh, immigrants rising. Now we have the undocumented collectives. We have the Center for Cultural Power, and they're all coming together to, to create advocacy through the, for artists um, and create change and to educate all of these, you know, companies, studios, foundations. So for me, it's like I'm not able to move forward. I cannot do this alone without community. I have been able to achieve what I have achieved, uh, whatever that might be, uh, with the help of allies of my community who have been creating and sharing resources. So by having these conversations and continue doing the work that we're all doing in our own field, I feel like that's the only way we're gonna continue advancing uh, in order to create more changes for the entire community. But also one thing that I wanna say, it's like from my part, I also, uh, I'm also uh, focused on on changing that mentality that Eliana was talking about, right? Where like maybe five years ago, I was just happy with giving the exposure and the opportunity, but with us artists, we also have to think business uh, and why people profit from their art. Why can we do the same, right? And many of us, we have the mentality that, oh, we, we should be just thankful with the opportunity, but that shouldn't, uh, just because of the immigration status, that shouldn't stop you from dreaming big. So I think that one of the things is sharing that we dream, we're, we're allowed to dream big, and second, to continue, we, there's no way we can do this alone. And to piggyback off of what Armando said, um, I think that community does give a place for people to resonate with the movement, and, um, and that allows for someone to build more confidence within that community. Um, and thus, you're able to enter more in places that were once intimidating to you with a greater chance of success, knowing that you came from a place with, from community uh, being surrounded by people who uh, face similar plights as you. I'd like to add to the conversation, especially because we're talking about entrepreneurship, that one of the main reasons that I've had such a positive experience as an artist, as a videographer, is because I've been able to do a lot of my work through a cooperative business. So I, I want to throw cooperatives also out there as an option for folks who want to be entrepreneurs, who want to like start a media production company, a business, and don't want to do it alone. And to this question of community, there's a way to do it that structurally can hold us in community and uh, have like anti-capitalist principles by nature and that can have... Um, our well-being and sustainability um, in mind, and I think that co-ops are a good, great option, especially you know, for, because owning a business is a lot of work. It's it's really hard, and it's not as fun if you're doing it alone. So, like, if you want to partner with folks, I really recommend um, cooperatives, and I think that's been one of the main reasons why I've been able to have such a positive experience. Um, I've never had a tokenizing experience because I'm, I work with a collaborative of people who understand. Uh, um, my experience and who, res but more importantly, respect me as a person and who um, I am in comradeship with. Um, and I want to throw out there for folks who are in Philly and who are interested in, in exploring cooperatives as an option, the Philadelphia Cooperative Alliance, Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance. There's also the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, and they also um, do a lot of support for startup co-ops. So that's also an option for folks who are looking for a way to be entrepreneurs in community.
Thank you so much, Shayla. Um, I just want to also kind of add to this is that one way we can hold partners and institutions accountable is to really um, kind of frame what their lim they think are limitations. For instance, you know, um, there's folks out there that believe that they can't, um, like, well, we don't know, there, there's undocumented filmmakers or creatives out there, so we didn't know how to hire them. We don't know, or we don't know how to work with them. And so um, just being loud and proud and saying that like, you know, we're out here, we exist, is essentially holding these partners accountable because they can't say, we can't find you and can't hire you, right? Or we can't find you and can't work with you. When, um, you know, the Undocumented Film Earth, Filmmakers Collective um, is working on a database of nationwide filmmakers, you know, we have to kind of make sure we have that rebuttal response to what why they aren't including us in the in production or in the stories right um like for instance um brown girls stock mafia now has a database so if there's people out there who are saying that they can't find um women of color or people of color trans uh, color um, producers and filmmakers there's a database out there that exists like we have to make sure that what the institutions say that they cannot do we are serving them the proof of saying no you can't we can do this because there are systems in place like immigrants rising um, that you know make this possible um, Sorry, just a little tangent there, but from the Q&A, um, this question is from Ileana. Um, Ileana, they're asking, um, as a company or as a nonprofit, we can, we can legally hire undocumented independent contractors or, um, and can, or, we don't we never really ask for people's status and it doesn't matter to us but we want to know what the law says that would um that would allow us to work with independent contractors without asking for status or we or can we hire them as full-time employees so that's a great question. And again, employment is the one thing that undocumented individuals without work authorization cannot do. Therefore, companies, nonprofit organizations cannot legally hire somebody who does not have that green card, work authorization, or social security number. However, um, and this is probably very common for individuals that are familiar with the W-9 form, for anybody who has ever done some type of contracting engagement with an individual, with a sole proprietor, with a limited liability corporation. Um, it's basically an exchange of forms for the purposes of paying taxes. So in a nonprofit company, you all are probably very used to contracting with a wide variety of contractors. And I bet you, you never once stop to even ask about immigration status because it's not part of the forms. The W-9 form does not uh, require having work authorization or a social security number. So it's basically in the, intended to be treated just the way you treat any other contractor that engages with you. Same thing uh, pertains to somebody who um, may, uh, may not have status. So it's basically just a matter of realizing that um, um, th this process works for individuals regardless of immigration status. But again, the hiring piece is the one that is not a possibility, but anything else outside of that, including contracting and business ownership is a possibility. And there's no reason to even ask about immigration status. Thank you so much, Eliana, for sharing. And, you know, in the spirit of um, kind of Ending on a high note, um, with so many creatives in this um, room here, I just want to ask for for everyone, what type of creative pursuits are you um, looking for lately? Um, what types of narratives and storylines do you look in a project? 
And so we could inform folks who are um, looking to partner with us what types of narratives um, y'all are looking for so we can uplift and hopefully someone out there contacts Dylan, contacts Shayla, contacts Armando, um, contacts all of us um, and, you know, creates work from this panel. I'd want to say that the type of pursuits that I'm currently looking for um, are ones of substance, ones of uh, purpose, like good intentions, things that are uh, separate from like the status quo of consumer or uh, of the normality that is consumerism. Um, those are the type of stories that I'm looking for really at all times. Um, I, I'll go really quickly. Um, in, in my professional work as a documentary filmmaker, um, looking to um, connect with folks that are interested in telling like a story that's not always U.S. based. Uh, I think when when I look at immigration stories, they usually, for the most part, start the minute that the family of the person arrives in the U.S. But I've always been interested in like everything that's happening in their home countries. And all the things that people like had to do to even make the decision of come here, um, and I think that's a really great opportunity for us to like look at our legacy and and look at families in in a deeper way than just like when you arrived here. And we know that's hard, right? But you know, what's the backstory? Love that. Yeah, our stories did not begin here. It. <laughs> it began the moment that we were born, so that's so important to note. Sheila, Armando, do you want to add before we wrap up? Sheila, you want to go first? Sure. Um, right now, um, in terms of creative pursuits, I mostly do documentary-based work, but I've been writing a lot. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Vona Writers Workshop. Um, to workshop some work, so I'm really excited to do more writing. And uh, I look for stories where people make difficult choices and then have to follow through with the consequences of their choices, um, regardless of what those choices are and where people exercise agency, um, whether it's like acceptable ways of exercising their agency or forms of agency that fall outside of what we've been taught to accept as um, for the purpose of our self-development or for the greater good, right? But what is the kind of agency that, that different kinds of individuals, given our context, have to exercise? Uh, from my part, I feel like I've been doing a little bit of everything, but this year I've been focusing on screenwriting. Uh, so what I would really love to see, and, and I'm sure it will happen, is I want to see more people of color uh, involved in the writing room in Hollywood, in mainstream media. And uh, it's 2020, and we're still seeing so many projects that are lacking authenticity. And the reason why that's happening is because uh, Hollywood is not listening yet, and they don't have people who are directly involved in the stories, and they don't do their research appropriately. So I'm looking forward to people of color stories uh, made by people of color uh, celebrating our existence. So everyone in the audience, um, you if you um, are looking to partner with us, um, we are definitely beyond our immigrant status and are happily and eagerly ready to partner and um, work with you. Um, and for those folks, just the resources out here, I'd like to thank um, Iliana for sharing um, your knowledge with everyone. Um, and please reach out to Immigrant Rising for any questions that you may have. Also, V, thank you so much for participating. Um, and please 
Um, look out for pieces, uh, pieces loud. Um, and thank you so much for um, joining us and in partnership with the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective and Black Star. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow at noon for the panel Solidarity is not a trend nor a market exchange. <laughs>